There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Let's sing it out. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. Jesus, there's nothing impossible When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Yeah. When all I see is the cross, God, you see. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And so mighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine i 
surrender Here in surrender In pure adoration I enter your courts With an offering of praise I am your servant Come to bring you glory As is fit for the works of your hands Now unto the Lamb As we sing Lord of Lords Now unto the Lamb Who sits on the throne be glory and honor in praise. All of creation resounds with the song. Worship and praise Him, the Lord of Lords. Spirit now living and dwelling within me. Keep my eyes fixed ever on Jesus. world ever swim me I'll run till I finish the race yeah now unto the Lamb who sits on the throne be glory and honor and praise all of creation resounds with the song worship and So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night.
Lord, you are the only one that can go before us, behind us, all around us. Lord, you're in the shadows. Lord, you see all things. Lord, we shouldn't be scared or afraid. But we would hope for our redemption draws near. Lord, we praise you, we love you, we thank you that we can count on you and go to you and run to you. You're our fortress. You are mighty and strong in battle, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that we would continue to fight. Lord, you've already won. You have overcome the world, Jesus. And so we thank you that we can rely upon you. We love you. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and say good morning and greet those around you. Father, this book is so amazing. And this chapter, as we open it up to what you have for us, Lord, it too is so amazing. It's so encouraging. It's so convicting. It's so uplifting. So Father, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would be able to glean this morning everything that you would have us to know. Lord, I ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say. Lord, that you would lead and direct and guide my words. And Lord, that they too would have power, not mine, but yours. Lord God, we know that you desire to speak and we are ready to hear. Your servants are here. Lord, we are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said, um, we're here in First Thessalonians. We're covering the whole of chapter 1. Now, it's only 10 verses, but it's still a lot to cover in the teaching. And as you're going to see as we go along, I'm going to kind of dial down into a couple things specifically. And I just want to put it front. If Pastor Jack were teaching this, you know how it would go, right? We would be in First Thessalonians 1 for, you know, maybe about four or five weeks. Because there's so much here. And like I said, when I prayed, it is so encouraging. It's so jam-packed with doctrine and exhortation and really good application for our lives. These verses are just a convincing testimony of the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel to truly and radically change lives. And ladies, I want to say that that power has never diminished over the millennia since it was spoken. It has never, ever changed, and today it should have as the same effect as it did upon the Thessalonians, it should have upon us as well, that we would have a clear and pure and holy testimony. That's going to be our goal in life, is it not? Is that we would be lights and witnesses, especially with what's going on. Um, you know, I mentioned this last night, the ground is, is moving underneath. And I don't mean the ground, you know, shaking like what happened in Turkey. We haven't had a 7.8, but can't you feel it? Can't you feel that the ground beneath us is a little bit unstable? It's certainly not like it it was a few months ago or even a year ago, it, some things are just radically altered forever and will never be the same. And we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. And I am so thankful that we're in this book because I believe it's really going to, again, just continue to prepare us as we've been going through, you know, we went to the seven churches and now here, you know, it's just going to prepare us for what lies ahead. So we can look at these, um, these people, this group, this church, the Greek calls it the Ecclesiastes. Ecclesi oh, don't forget it. I'm not even going to try and tell you because I can't pronounce it this morning. <laughs> I clearly haven't had enough coffee. Um, the church. We can look at them and we can want to be like them. We can want to emulate them. I know I do. Oh, I can't do that because it covers up the mic. Um, it's going to be a wild morning. Uh, but we have to ask why. I love to ask questions. Why were they the way they were? What made them so unique? Why did they get such praise from Paul? Because, you know, this is the only church. Paul founded a lot of churches. Some people will tell you that he founded seven. Some people will tell you that he founded 14. Some will tell you that he founded 20. They really don't know. They just know that wherever he went, people came to Christ. The gospel was given and people responded. And so they don't really know, but so he knew, my point is this, is he knew churches. So why this church? Why is this the only church that he commends in this way? Out of all of the, the epistles in his letters, why? There's something so very just cool about them that I want to be like, and I hope you do too. So I ask what and why, but then 
what do I do with it? How does this impact my life and what am I supposed to take away from it? My goal this morning is that when we leave from our very short time together, and I'm going to talk really fast, I'm going to try not to because it's good stuff, but a lot of it, that we walk away with a knowledge and an understanding that can truly, if we will grasp onto it, if we will really take it within us, digest it, that it really can impact our lives. So what I'm going to do is I'm just, it's 10 verses, we're not going to cover everything because there's so much, but I am going to read to you the first five verses. So here we go. Paul, Sylvanius, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Fa God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And I just have to say, this is not in my notes, but I am so thrilled to read that, that last part among you for your sake. We do live our lives in front of other people, and sometimes we need to consider how we live those lives for the sake of others. So there are a few things that stand out right away, and the first thing is, is the God-centeredness of this, of this chapter, because every verse of the 10, ex with the exception of one, verse seven, has some reference to God, to Jesus, or to the Holy Spirit. And that's key because that forms the foundation of why the Thessalonians were different. And I want you to notice also, in connection with those titles, those names, is the word in. Now, we tend to overlook those little words, but in the Greek, sometimes they have a wealth of meaning. And this particular word is spelled E-N instead of I-N, and it means under the influence of or the aid of. Of, by. So either they're under, when you are in Christ Jesus, when you are in the Holy, walking in the Holy Spirit, when you are in God, you are under their influence and you are aided by them. They give you what you need. And is that not what Jesus said is the work of the Holy Spirit to teach us, to instruct us, to give us power for living? In. It is important that we understand this because this is the first answer to our question of why were they so unique. They were unique, this, this church at Thessalonica, because they were founded upon God in his triunity, God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, the triune God, and they were aided and abetted. They were influenced by this union that they had with them. And when you look at the at God, just the phrase, just the word God, and you see how it goes from the God, the God the Father, to God our Father, it suggests something else that I think is just so wonderful because it goes from God the Father like he's out there, like he belongs you know, to a, or this whole group of people, to God our Father. It tells us that we're part of his family. And this is the second thing that I saw that made them just really grasp onto the gospel is because they were founded in God, but they understood that now they were adopted into the family. They belong to him. And I, I have here in Southern California, I have a very small family, very, very small family. And I'm always so envious of people that have these big families and they're always getting together and doing, you know, barbecue and this and that and the other. The God just didn't design that for my life. But it's just to know that it doesn't matter whether you're just a single or many, that you and me, we are part of each other. So when I look out and I see all of you, you're my family. So I know that Pastor Jack has said in the, in the past, and, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but he has said about how blood is thicker than water. Well, ladies, the, the relationship that we... Um, uh, celebrate together, spirit is thicker. The In the spirit, the relationship that we have as family is thicker, and these people were in it together. They were in Christ, but they were also the brethren. Brethren, that word brethren appears 19 times 
in 1 Thessalonians, just in this one book. And so it's, it's a repeated thing that he wants us to understand that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I love that. I appreciate that. Because when times get tough, and I'm going to mention this over and over, you have to remember the background of this, of this area is that when they accepted the gospel, persecution came. Affliction came, because remember, it says you received this in much affliction. And so that's the background. But when those things come and you see that God is with me, I'm part of his family, but I'm also part of a larger family, it does something within you, and it helps you live for the sake of others. Not that we live for the opinion of others, but we live to bless others because we consider others. It says that they are beloved brethren, and I want to draw these two ideas together about beloved and brethren. I want to draw your attention to the word love. We see it in verse 3 and in verse 4. In verse 3, it's the character or the qualities of agape love. And in verse 4, the word beloved is also the same word in Greek. It's agape. And it, is, it shows the direction of the will. So what this tells us is that God's agape love, pure, holy, sacrificial love, that we are the recipients of it. His will was directed towards us to give us and to bless us in his agape love. And that is key as well. That was another thing that they grasped onto. Paul said, beloved brethren, God loves you so much. And again, when things are tough, when things are uncertain, when the ground is a little unstable, for whatever reason it would be, maybe it's just a little tremor, maybe it's a two, maybe it's a, you know, it's a six. When we can hold on to that, it brings stability to our lives. The construction in the Greek language shows that God's love existed for us in the past, but it continues to the present and will continue on unabated in its strength. God's love for us never, ever wavers. Sometimes we might feel like it. Sometimes we don't feel his love or see his love. But this is the thing about agape love. It chooses the best. It always chooses the best. And so when I don't know what I don't know is going on, then I go, but Lord, you do. And you're choosing for me the best path. I don't know, but I do know that you have a plan. So I'm just going to walk day by day with you, no matter what is going on. And that, again, is key to what the Thessalonians knew and believed and had taken into themselves. That unending unending love would never diminish. And Paul said that these brethren were special. But why were they special? He said, knowing beloved brethren, your election by God, it was what they knew that really, really changed their lives. And we're going to look at that. He said, knowing your election. Now, the topic of election or the doctrine of election is big. It really is. And there's no way. And again, if Pastor Jack were teaching, we would be spending a lot of time and he would be so much more thorough. I'm just going to skim the surface because Paul said it. And after reading this and after studying this, I understand Lord, this was so key to their stability and the life that they live for other people is this doctrine of election. So we're going to look at it just ever so briefly. He said knowing. The word knowing um, in Greek, there are two types of knowing. There's one that is oida knowledge and one that is gnosko. Gnosko is by experience. And that's what we really like because we can touch it, we can feel it. Oida knowledge is when you hear it. It's, It's a mental thing. It's a mental understanding of what you are hearing. And that is what this knowing is. They heard the gospel as Paul presented it. We'll read in just a few minutes that it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it went into their minds and down into their hearts and it changed their lives. They understood it clearly. Now we don't know what what Paul said to them because we know that he was with them for you know a while but we don't know the conversations that was had you know when he was teaching them or the conversations when they were eating or what was going on but this stuck with them this truth this doctrine of election their understanding of it made an impact in their lives as it should in ours and again we can't cover it all but we're just going to look at a couple things 
First off, election runs through all of scripture, beginning in, with Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, where we read that God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. We see it again in God's choice of the nation of Israel out of the nations in Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6. I'm not going to read them to you. You can look them up later if you want. The word election means to choose or to select for oneself. And it gives favor to the chosen object, to the chosen person, with a view of a relationship that is going to be established. So stop there for a moment and look back at what we've already talked about, the relationship that we have in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And now this relationship is going to be established and it's established in love. And there's a favor that goes with that, with being elect. And so that's what this teaches. But this is very, very important because I know that so many of us come from different denominational backgrounds and different persuasions. This is what it does not mean. It does not mean or imply rejection of what has not been chosen. Some people would like to believe and like to say that God goes eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And there's a little rhyme that goes with that that I can't think of at the moment. And that God just picks and chooses willy-nilly, but that's not true at all. That's not true at all. And we're going to see that he knows the sovereign Lord. Mary said it when she was up here giving announcements. Um, the sovereign Lord knows. And some of these things are so deep, and you really do need to spend the time to study them. But when we can grasp them and understand them, they make all the difference. So it doesn't imply rejection. And this is hugely important. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. And I don't have it written down here, but I know that the rest of that passage goes on, and the Lord says next, turn turn and live. This is what God desires. And then automatically our minds go to John 3.16, does it not? But what about John 3.17? It says there in that passage, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That's God's heart. That's God's heart. But he knows that not everyone wants to be saved. Not everyone wants him. And that's the truth of the matter. But God does know because election occurred before the foundation of the world and it is a work of a sovereign God who knows all things and is over all things. And to me, that is so comforting because in so many other areas, it's like, Lord, you're in control. You know my life from beginning to end. And in that, I rest because I'm, so, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. See those words all together having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Of his will, the good pleasure, it was God's pleasure, but it is according to his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved accepted in Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here this morning and you are uncertain if you are of the elect, let me just say, if you're even having that thought, if you even have that desire, then say yes to Jesus Christ. Yes to what God has offered you and has called out to you because God wants you to be saved. And for those of us that are saved, he wants us to know how sure and how steady, how rock solid our salvation is that he called us. He called us and he called us with a purpose. 
That's what I think they really understood as well. It wasn't just called just to be called, just to sit, call you up and say, hey, how are you doing today? No, he called us with a purpose. And we see it in the genealogy of First Chronicles. Um, I just happened upon First Chronicles as an accident, and it starts off, very first one, it starts off with the genealogy. I have a terrible confession. I'm not a fan of genealogies. I can't pronounce the words. I never learned phonics. And it's just, it's hard. But for some reason, this week when I was studying, I'm just, oh, the heavens opened. And I was like, Lord, this is so exciting. Okay, it's kind of a strange day when I say that the genealogies are exciting, but it was, it was thrilling. Oh my goodness, because we read in that history, we, it starts with Adam. And so, you know, genealogies, you know, usually it's got the firstborn and this and that. Not so in this one, not so in this one. It went from Adam to Seth. Well, wait a minute, what happened to Cain? Because Cain was firstborn. Okay, that's interesting. So it went from Adam to Seth, even though Cain was his firstborn. And then it started going on, and it, you saw now it's confirming the tribe of Judah, the lineage of Judah. And now it's going into the house of David. I'm just going, and even as I'm saying that, I'm getting goosebumps. It's like, oh my goodness, Lord, because he was looking at, the writer of Chronicles was looking at the priestly, the spiritual aspect of what was happening. It was purposeful. You could see the channels of God working through what we call the godly line of Seth, working down through the, the ages, down to the Messiah, who the Bible said must come from the house of David. He must sit on the throne of David. And when I was done reading that, I just wanted to say hallelujah. I will read every genealogy from here on out, because Lord, you have something special to show us. But it's purposeful. But if it's purposeful in that way, and we serve the same Lord, the same God, is his purpose, his calling, his election in our life, is it not purposeful for us as well? I would say yes. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He has a plan for our lives. Election is also individual. It is not corporate. And again, I know that some people ascribe to this whole idea that if my mom was saved and my dad was saved, I must be saved. That is not true and that is not biblical. In Matthew 10, 34, we actually read how the gospel divides families. I talked with someone this morning. It has divided their family. It's caused division in my own family, my extended family. Because just because they're in our family does not mean that they want Christ. Doesn't mean they'll never want Christ. We keep giving the gospel because we don't know. Because, you know, for a long time, you know, we were Christ rejectors too. So we keep giving the gospel, but it's not a corporate thing, not at all. It doesn't mean that just because you belong to a certain religious organization or group or that your family is saved, it doesn't mean that you're saved. It is a personal choice. Election is a matter of personal faith. Yes, when we talk about the church, there are individuals within that group that make up the church that are saved but that they had to accept individually. Joshua, when he was talking to the children of Israel, he made that very clear. In Joshua 24, 15, he told them, choose. Just like God said, turn, Joshua said, choose. Choose this day who you will serve. And he laid it out. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the world. There is no both in this equation. You must choose who you're going to serve. So it's, it's interesting, and sometimes it's hard for us to grasp onto, but it is an act of a sovereign God that also requires an act of our will. God gives us free will to choose, but he does know. He does know who will choose, and we see that in this next passage. Election should bring comfort to believers and we see that in Romans 8.28. And again, that's a passage where we tend to stop, just like John 3.16. We tend to stop right there. But let's continue on through verse 30. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. We are to be conformed. Our lives are to be different that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these 
he also glorified, looking ahead. Oh my goodness, we're called and we're justified. Ladies, this whole idea, this whole doctrine of election should bring us such confidence and boldness, and I'm talking to myself, that we should just have the freedom to live our lives as Christians, not being afraid to say something to someone that, oh my goodness, maybe they don't want to hear it, or what are they going to do? We already know some are going to reject us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of us are going to be made fun of. Someday we may even be persecuted. But it says here, he also glorified. They knew that. The Thessalonians knew that. They knew that one day, one day, how glorious is that? How comforting, how convicting, but yet how strengthening. And then the final thing that I want to look at with election, it proceeds out of God's love. We already have seen that his agape love is directed towards us. We are the object of his affection. And Deuteronomy 7, 6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples of the face of the earth. Now he's speaking to Israel, but it applies to us because we read this in Peter, 1 Peter. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than other people. For you are the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you, the sovereign, almighty God loves me, loves you. There's nothing more strengthening, nothing more comforting, and to know how solid it was from the foundation of the world he purposed that I would be standing here, you would be sitting there. He purposed that I would go there and you would go there. And all the different places and all the, the different people that we're going to meet, he has a purpose for us. They grasped onto that. They understand, understood because Paul said, knowing you heard it, you heard it explained, you, they probably read the Old Testament because that's all they would have had. And so they looked at it and they went, oh my goodness. Now I see, and now my life is going to be different from this time on. So how do others know that we're the elect? We can see that we can see how we know, but how do others know? The same way as the Thessalonians, through changed lives. And I'm going to reread to you verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. It, Paul's saying, hey, it wasn't through my eloquence. It wasn't because I had a lot of great words. Because you can have someone who just has smooth words, and they can just, they're a wordsmith. They can pop it all together, and it just makes sense. But it wasn't that. It wasn't that at all, even though words were used, which is why I said before, just because you don't think someone, you know, is receptive to the gospel, have at it. Still go at it, because you don't know. You don't know maybe a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now. But we are to give the gospel. So words were used, but it wasn't because of Paul's eloquence. It says here that it was in power. The sincerity and the simplicity of the spoken gospel message empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we need to remember that. It tells us to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. And so when we get ready to give people the gospel, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to make it powerful in their minds and in their hearing. You know, when you read about how some of the great saints got saved, people like Charles Spurgeon, it was just some country preacher. It wasn't even the one he was supposed to be talking. And basically he said, look to Jesus and be saved. I mean, I'm really butchering it, but that's kind of the gist of it. And he was saved. How does that happen? How does that happen? God takes everything and he takes it by the power of the Holy Spirit and he places it within the mind and the heart, that we make that conscious choice, not based on ooey-gooey feelings. That wasn't what Paul said. It wasn't based on this experience of signs and wonders and, you know, and all this other stuff. The clear presentation of the Word of God. I love what Bible commentator John Stott says. He says, the Spirit without the Word is weaponless, but the Word without the Spirit is powerless. And we need to remember that. It's not us. It's God who does the work. God who does the calling. We just need to be the messengers. And it brought complete assurance. He said, you received it in much. And in English, much doesn't mean much. 
But in the Greek, it means exceedingly abundantly. It's like a superlative. They got it, and it gave them assurance. They knew with absolute certainty and conviction of the truth and the power that they were saved from their sins. And I don't know about you, because I don't know your stories. I mean, I know some of your stories. I lived an exceedingly wicked life before I came to Christ. And the peace that was in our lesson, this isn't in my notes, but I just want to say the peace that came over my mind and my heart to know that I was forgiven of all of those sins. And that in the future, in the future, I could live not having to just worry over every little thing that I could come to the Father. I could ask, I could repent and I could ask for forgiveness. It was amazing. And maybe that was your story as well. But maybe you came from a Christian family and you didn't really have that kind of a background. It doesn't matter because sin is sin. And we tend to negate the sinfulness of sin, little, big, or anything in between. And yet we have been forgiven. Again, it should bring us such confidence and assurance. So they knew what they knew as far as doctrine, but then they knew what to do about it, and they went to work. Paul and the others lived their lives with the knowledge that they were elect, because that doctrine is meant to foster an assurance and humility, not presumption or pride. So it wasn't like, I'm somebody special. We are, but it's not to be prideful. It was meant to foster holiness, not apathy. Not saying, well, I'm saved now and I can just sit around and really not do anything. It's okay. I can do whatever I please. It's meant to be a strong witness to the world around us, not laziness. To just again say, I don't need to do anything. This doctrine shouldn't generate fear or uncertainty, but awe. Awe struck wonder as to what has been done for us. Because the display of God's grace and his love should radically change our lives. For those of you who have ever been in love, you know what that's like. And this is so much beyond that, so much more. God's agape love forms the basis of our relationship with him. In John 4, 19, it says we love him because he first loved us. God initiated that. We can't initiate agape love on our own that we are to give to other people, but he can do it in us. But we must first have been the recipients of it. And it only comes, <clears throat> excuse me, when the Holy Spirit's working within us, when we are in the Holy Spirit, walking in that, and when we are obeying God's commands. And we see their work in their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patient endurance. Characteristics that Puritan Pastor John Calvin called a brief but true picture of Christianity. Wow, if we just do those things, those three things, it is a picture to the world around us of our Christianity. But their work of faith wasn't exactly what maybe you might think it was. It was the initial act of faith that brought them to salvation. But it didn't stop there. It went on and went into action. And that's how it should be for us as well. Because James tells us in James 2.7 that faith without works is dead. It means nothing because it's supposed to do something in our lives. It's supposed to produce a change. And when we look at now the next little group of labor of love, it is agape love, but we have a tendency to think of work and labor as the same, and, and, but they're not. They're not the same thing. This labor was about the exertion, about the fatigue that went along with what they were doing. And sometimes we get tired. I can tell you for a fact that the pastors get tired. I can tell you, for, there's a lot of people, children's ministry, they get tired. We get tired serving our family. You know, we get tired doing dishes. We get tired doing laundry. We get tired of, you know, whatever the situation would be that we're doing. Sometimes it's not as simple as doing the dishes and doing laundry. Sometimes it's way more than that. Being a caregiver, doing whatever for someone else's sake to show the love of God. It's tiresome, and that's what this word means. It means extremely stressful and tiresome. It's fatiguing. It requires exertion. It's not always easy. But when it's done out of love, it makes the burden lighter. So what does that look like for God's elect? When, when we are called the elect and we're supposed to love and we're supposed to have that labor of love, what does it look like? Well, if you flip a few pages back in your Bible, you can go back to Colossians 3.12, and I'll read it to you. Therefore, as the elect of God, so this is what we're supposed to be doing, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, 
meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That's to cover everything that we do because we've been the recipients. It's the core and foundation of our relationship with God and the blood of Christ, how much he loved us. And that's what we're to give to others. Because when you look at this list, when I was reading this list and studying it, I just went, oh, um, there's a problem here. But that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's what tells you that you're in Christ. And it's a good thing. Because then we can remedy that situation in the Lord. But it sees, says clearly what we're to be doing. When we understand who we are, elect and beloved, it makes all the difference. And it makes our burden lighter. It also allows us to be patient which is endurance in the Greek, and it's associated with hope. And what it means is that you don't surrender and you don't give up under bad circumstances. It, this word has nothing to do with long-suffering. Long-suffering is, is, is often translated patience, and long-suffering has to do with people, but this has to do with circumstances. Their circumstances were not going to change. And how often in our world today, when our circumstances are relentless, and they don't have, they're, not, they're not gonna change, we want a way out. We just want a way out. And, you know, I had this brought home to me by a story that a friend shared with me not too long ago about a husband and a wife. And uh, they were married. They had just, they were newlyweds. And um, going about their business, they'd been married for about a week. And she was driving the car and was in a car accident, not her fault. And she was thrown through the windshield. Obviously, didn't have a seatbelt on. And uh, she was thrown through the windshield and she was paralyzed. Quad quadriplegic. Of course, the newlywed husband was devastated, went to my friend and said, do I have to stay with her? Because he couldn't, he couldn't wrap his head around that life. Couldn't wrap his head around that life. Circumstances were not gonna change. And in all love, with all patience, and all mercy and grace, my friend said yes, yes. They understood this. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how radical, if we really, ladies, I'd love to say that just because I'm standing in front of you that I grasp this. When I was reading this, I just thought, Lord, there's so much more I need from you to live that radical life. And I'm not talking about the, some of the Christianity that we see that's just a little bit out there. I'm just talking about the life that God has given me to live a radical life right here, right now, in front of my neighbors, in front of my family, just in front of you. It's like, wow, Lord, I want every day a greater grasp and understanding of who you are, of your love, that I'm the beloved, that I'm called of you, I have a purpose in my life, and that, Lord, that I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to have that endurance no matter what the circumstances are because this is not the end. This is not the end of the story. And Lord, I want what you have for me because I know all things work together for good because you've seen, you called me, and you know. And I know from looking at your faces, it's what you want too because that's a work of the Spirit within us. It's amazing. And that brings us to the end of what I want to share with you. And it's in verses 9 and 10. That knowing our future causes us to rest and have assurance. It says, therefore, they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to serve, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I love that verse 10 ends that way, and to wait for his son from heaven. This shows us in these two verses a series of what I call turnings. They turned from idols, but they turned to God, and they turned and they looked upward. They turned their eyes upwards to see what was the end. 
that they were going to be spared. Jesus says to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us. They were going to be delivered from the wrath to come. The return of Jesus is a source of hope for Christians for several reasons, but the reason that Paul mentions right here is deliverance of the saints from the coming wrath of God. And what does this mean? Does it mean that Jesus delivers us out of an existing wrath or that we'll be delivered from ever experiencing them? We have to look at this very carefully and in context, in the context of what is being written, not what we want it to say. That's why it is so important that we read the passage. We read the passage in, you know, paragraph, paragraph. You read the whole thing. Then you read the chapter. Then you read the book. Then you read the Bible that you have in context here. And so that's what we're going to look at here just ever so quickly. So it needs to be looked at in context because context is the final arbiter of every Bible verse and every doctrine. So it's important not to take them out of context. And I just want to take a moment just to say, just a brief statement, just to say that Pastor Jack and the leadership here, that what they hold to in regard to some of the things that we're talking about here is a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, futuristic, literal view of scripture. And if you want to know what that means, I can, we can talk about it later. But I just want to put that out there, that we are not going to, I'm really skipping over my notes for sake of time, but that we, believers, will escape all aspects of God's wrath, and that includes the tribulation. We are not going to go through it because it says from the coming wrath. It doesn't say out of. If Paul thought that they were going to see the tribulation, you know Paul, he's very good at, at parsing his words. He would have said, prepare for it. He did not say prepare for it. So we're not going to go through an, oh, midway, you know, we're going to be taken out. No, we're going to be spared from it. You can read in Revelation after a certain point, from I think it's from chapter 4 on, the church doesn't appear. You read, remember, 1 Thessalonians is about the church and the rapture of the church. 2 Thessalonians is about the second coming. We are never going to experience that. That alone, that alone, no matter how difficult it gets for us, and we have to expect that it's going to get difficult. Throughout the millennia, Christians have experienced persecution and difficulty. We can't expect that we would be any different. We have been blessed by God for so long. Let us not take it for granted. But the end is that we are not going to experience the wrath of the Almighty God. I, amen. I am so thankful. I am so thankful. Especially when you read the scriptures. It's like, oh Lord. And it gave them complete confidence. We can go about our life no matter what goes on right now knowing what lies ahead. They knew their future. They knew their future. The assurance of Christ's appearing allowed them to live with conviction and confidence and to serve with commitment until their master called them up to be with him in heaven. And I just want to insert this real quick. The word serve is actually the word doulos. It means a bond servant for life. And that's what they committed to that they would serve him no matter what, knowing what he had already purposed for them and was going to do for them, what was already set in eternity for them. They could say, it's okay, it's okay. I'm gonna live and serve you for the rest of my life, and so shall we. Father, we thank you for your word that it brings encouragement, it strengthens us. Lord, you've given us details. You've given us doctrine. Not that it's something dusty that we dust off, that you know we take it off the shelf whenever we need to have a religious conversation. No, we need to know it, to know what you have promised us, to know the perimeters of our salvation, to know the blessings of what you've given to us. Oh, Lord God, Paul said that knowing beloved brethren, I want to say knowing beloved Chino Hillians, your election by God. Lord, may we take this and may you just sink it deep within our spiritual bowels that we would live differently, that we would have impactful lives in the course that you've set for us. We may never be a Chuck Swindoll or some other person that we really admire, 
But Lord, maybe you've set us in a small corner of our own world. But Lord, wherever you have placed us, Lord, may we have an impact for your glory and for your honor as your servants. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.